So we'll look at a variety of techniques, mainly using acrylic paints, uh, the inexpensive craft paints, uh, whether they be in those two ounce tubes or the smaller potted paints and brush applying those over primed items. And we'll look at a variety of examples as we go through the clinic. One of the specialty ones we'll look at is finishing black objects, uh, mainly because that seems to uh, give people a harder time. So we'll look at maybe some techniques that you be able to use in some of your models. A weathering wood because building in wood is one of the more popular mediums. So we'll look at faded paint or peeling paint, that type of uh, finishing. And then we'll start really working with styrene. And that's, that's probably uh, one of the items that, that folks ask about the most is why do you use so much styrene? Well, it's very convenient, particularly for instance, this structure. Uh, this is an Owen 30 sand house combined with a hand car shed and the HO novelty siding that Evergreen Styrene makes really matched up the novelty type siding that the prototype had. So this was a structure that was in New York as part of the Arcade and Attica short line. So when I took the model railroader, and they're probably from the mid 1970s and scaled them up with a photocopier, I realized that the, the, the siding um, looked a lot like uh, what I'd had already on hand. So having not worked with styrene before in simulating wood, it put together then some practice pieces. And that's just what I really recommend that anytime you try a new finishing technique, whether it be flat out painting or some sort of weathering, is that you practice first on, you know, some sort of oh, uh, model that you're not interested in or just uh, some of these pra practice type panels. Or if you can't really, um, you, know, you really want to get started, you can't wait, just practice on the back side or the side that's uh, towards the backdrop. So at least by the time you get to the front, you'll be comfortable with that technique. So that's the raw piece of styrene. And, and the thing about styrene is it's really too perfect when you compare it to wood. So I like to rough it up, uh, whether adding wood grain with a hobby knife blade or even the, uh, the brush that you see, that it's one of the soldering brushes that you can buy from Micromark, um, or you could use a hundred grit sandpaper, but just rough, rough up the surface a little bit and then uh, prime it. Uh, this model is 16, 17 years old, so it was still using Floquel before it was discontinued. So I just brush painted and you can see it's not very uniform there on that second panel. Uh, you can see some of the white come through and that's really what you want is to have some sort of variation when you use sheet styrene to simulate individual boards. And then what I like to do is temper that with a little bit of, of, of black stain. You can use thinned acrylic or you can use uh, alcohol and India ink. I know folks uh, like one or the other. So I use them interchangeably. This was just a little bit of yeah, of black, uh, black paint. And then as far as the white base coat there, uh, I used acrylic from a tube, which is Liquitex. And it's a little thicker than the normal craft paints, but the key is just to use a flat brush and then you can see it in the lower right uh, where it could cover two or three boards at one time. But if you brush along the grain, if you get any brush marks, then they just look like wood grain. And then that last panel there on the right was just putting a, a, just another slight coat of diluted black over that just to add some shadows and to dirty up the, um, the, the, the surface. So this is really then the finished model. And it's those same techniques then we just went over, but on individual boards. In some cases, I, I did go ahead and, and say scrape the surface just to make it look like most of the paint came off. You can also use a brush with a little bit of alcohol if you want to take off some of the acrylic. And then the, the, the other aspect is then being able to make boards where the paint has really, you know, uh, adhered or stayed on, particularly under many times the eaves, and in this case, the, the door frame. And that then you can just dry brush a little bit more white on there if you want to add some paint. So it's back and forth between abrading the surface and adding a little bit more paint. 
So hopefully the styrene sheet, which is all the, the, the siding, and then all the other details, which are actually made out of basswood, the door, the frame, this sheeting here, it's indistinguishable really what material you use. So if you use a sequential step, then you don't have to be inhibited which type of material you model with. So as far as the wood, and again, all of these surfaces that you see, the, the siding, the door, um, they're all made out of basswood. So in this case, I just used India ink stain, and it's three drops of India ink per ounce of rubbing alcohol, and then just applied the white in the same fashion. So the only thing that's really different than painting, weathering the wood components with the styrene components is you don't have to prime it with that, that color. The other aspect I like about using styrene, and so you can see inside in this hand car shed, you can see the sheath. So that's just a piece of styrene, scribe styrene from Evergreen, and then stained basswood studs were glued on. And again, with styrene and wood, I just use Elmer's Carpenter's yellow glue. And if I really want the joint to be strong, I'll add a little bit of Loctite CA, and that's really good enough to to adhere those dissimilar materials. But the, all, almost all models I make, the roof panels, and then sometimes the siding, I'll just use sheet styrene so that, that you can look in and it looks like it's individual sheath boards. And on this hand car shed, it had tar and insole brick on the outside. So that's why I was able to do that. But I have laminated 20,000 styrene on either side so that if you wanted Donald that you could you could then uh, simulate boards then with just sheet sheath uh, or scribed sheet styrene. Now as far as the tar paper that you've seen so far on this model it's just painted typing paper so just the old-fashioned three ring notebook typing paper and then just taking a very inexpensive spray can a flat black. So, you know, if you live near a Walmart or some other discount store, get their cheapest flat black and just spray an entire side of a notebook page. And why I like that is then you can use the blue lines on the back side once it's dried for several hours, then to cut various uh, strips or sheets. The other thing is if you want to do something a little bit different say in this case hexagonal paper or hex paper. Uh, there's other shapes. Um, someone asked, can you get a Cricut to cut these? And that, that you can do that as well. Again, this was quite a, quite a long time of, uh, before Cricuts were even available. So just hand cut those, but same sort of thing, print out one side, paint the other, and then you can cut out the individual shingles and, and then pieces of, of tar paper, the patches and the, and the bigger pieces as well. So even though these all started as flat black spray painted, uh, were lightly dry brushed to highlight the edges. And we'll, we'll look at the technique of dry brush in a little bit, but it's just taking a very wide brush and going over in a diagonal fashion. And this was a tan color that was used then to kind of gray them, but then accent the edges that you can see slightly highlighted. And then a brown stain for these shingles, again, these were painted black, but just a very thin uh, stain or wash where you take brown acrylic and just thin it with a little bit of tap water and then just brush it over once, it, once uh, the entire roof was installed. Then you can see just a slight variation in color between the three, you know, three different roof panels. This is another illustration of just using that thin acrylic black wash. So this is a, a Mans Creek Hopper um, that was scratch built from cast urethane sides and then some basswood along the bottom. And then it was just sprayed with some sort of, I think Rust-Oleum or Krylon, one of their camouflage line, um, types and they have sand and some darker brown so they're very flat 
So they, they're very good primers. And again, just wanting to get a uniform color because of the dissimilar materials, white and then just raw basswood. And then by mixing up a stain and just going over that, just flooding it with a large brush and letting it, it dry, then not only imparts a, a black color, and again, these were unpainted, but because they were coal haulers, they turned almost black in the photos, but then all the shadows and details that are brought out. And the common question is really how strong should I make the, the, the stain or the wash? And, and again, it's almost go ahead and practice on some other models and then you'll know how much paint and water to put in to really get the wash that you're looking at. If you want to air, air on a weak side because then you can just add more stains as you go to make them to make the models darker so then this is another illustration that of gen selective stains were added for instance this board then went back and stained it several times to get it much darker than the rest so that's how you can then build up individual components to be a little bit darker or a little bit more weathered with just selective staining by using then a, a, uh, a just a finer brush. Also, I'd like to detail models with these smaller craft acrylics. You can usually buy 16 to 20 or so various colors for five or six dollars. So they're very economical. They have about a two to three year shelf life. And sometimes they come in groupings. For instance, this was an autumn set that had a lot of browns and oranges, which are very good for rust and and uh, corrosion type accents. The other thing with being a coal car, you tend to use those powders or chocks and then um, Bragdon and AMI and some other sonal surface where, where you'd see an accumulation of, um, of dust and, you know, and just really the grind that would come along or go along with a coal hauler. This is another example of then black and accenting items so that you don't lose really any of the detail. So this is a microengineering styrene model. It may be a, look, a little different because instead of the cross braces, I just added brass wires with turnbuckles to make, make some tie rods just to make it look a little bit lighter because this is a HON3 model. So it was spray painted black and then dry brushed with tan to bring out the detail, and then many times flooded with water and then just dabbed with acrylics to make some of those rust streaks and rust blotches. So this is that comparison of looking at just items painted with flat black and then using a tan color, um, and again, this actually is the latex that I use to seal the foam on my layout, but really any craft paint that's an intermediate tan you can use. So using a wide brush with just a little bit of paint, most of it rubbed off onto a napkin, you can see then how it, just by dry brushing with tan over flat black gives you kind of a gray color. This is a little bit exaggerated, but you can see how the cross bracing and a lot of the rivet details have been brought out by just a light application of this color tan. Oops, sorry about that. Let's get back to where that was. So the, the idea is to assemble the model, spray paint it, and then go over it with this tan color, accent all the detail, and then if you want to then add the corrosion, you can go ahead and do that. And that, that was the same case with this locomotive model as well. The idea here was to really also have a few different types of black that the smokestack, the smoke box was a little bit different than the tender. Photo doesn't exactly show that, but if you saw the model in person, there are some subtleties along with the back head as well. Um, as far as the uh, the kit bash itself, this was a, uh, a Bachman Forney that was cut apart essentially so we could have really this 040 locomotive and then that short, short tender. And a variety of material was used uh, from, from basswood to grant line uh, type styrene to, 
to brass to just regular sheet styrene and then the smokestack was actually cardstock so it really doesn't matter the materials because a lot of times then i'll go and prime them and in this case even though it's going to be a black model it's much easier when you're building and priming to prime with a lighter color a gray color and i used to use the walmart gray primer because it was such a thin coat i think they've since discontinued that but i think if you buy the rustoleum or the krylon the lighter colors I, I think what you want to stay away from is any of the auto body primers that are the thicker almost um, build up type so you want to go with the thick, thinnest cheapest type primer but that allows you then to look at the model as you go um uh if you use a grayer or a or a lighter tan color so in this case it was easy to put the, the cardstock bands on and then the rivets were just decals and then the stack patches were just pieces of graph paper and then it's then after you're done with the construction you can go back and prime it black so in this kit bash the can motor hung out into the cab so Grant Line, and now it's San Juan, um, made a 18-ton backhead porter kit. So it's almost exclusively molded in black plastic, uh, with the exception of the, the valve handles. And then I added a few other components that were mainly brass wire. But in this case, the, because it was such fine detail and everything else, I didn't want to really prime it black. So I just hand painted it dull coat, um, which again, it's lacquer based. So it's not going to come off with the various washes and then just use a variety of washes then to create uh, somewhat of a, a grayer color in, in this area. And then the front of it, more of a rust color. And just by essentially washing very thin coats, of brown or kind of reddish brown, being able to really coat all of these items after it was dull coated. It's, it's really important that these acrylics don't work well on, on raw plastic. So in some way you have to prime them, whether it's case dull coat, which is clear, but it's flat and it gives enough tooth for even washes to, to adhere to. And in this case, uh, just a little bit of um, of gloss and a little bit of shine in a very you know kind of dirty and grimy area and that was just done by taking a gauge reduce photocopying it down so it fit this stand and then painting the outer edge to make it look like brass and then using a little bit of tester's gloss coat just to dab the front of that piece of paper to make it look like a, a piece of glass so the idea also that even though this cab is, is open, when you paint uh, items that are interior and they're black, you want to paint them just a slightly lighter than you normally would, just because then you can see all this detail. Uh, if it was really a dark, you know, really as approach as black, you wouldn't be able to see it. And there's a little bit of dry brushing here that also brings out uh, the detail as well. All right, so now we'll look at then really a systematic way that you may, may think about applying. You've seen several examples now and, and since really developed this almost procedure or step, stepwise method in using these craft acrylics. So all the models that you see in, in this shot were, were painted with these craft acrylics. So the, the one thing is that you can see there's a variety of names I, and I, I'm convinced that really the same manufacturer makes all, all the paint. It, it just happens to be marketed under different names. And if it, if it doesn't say in the, in the label that it's satin or gloss, then it will dry flat. And that's really what you want, unless you're looking for gloss. So I bought this one by mistake. You can see clearly it says gloss, but I bought it anyway. Um, thinking that it was flat. So just look to make sure that the, the label doesn't say gloss um, or satin or some other um, 
novelty like sparkle that sort of thing the same thing with uh, with these unless they specifically say gloss then you you will get flat acrylics and that's really the 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 uh the wide range um that there's available out there so the idea is that you get a solvent based primer this is the old Walmart brand. And then you can brush apply these, whether they be regular strength for imparting a color or diluting down or just using a little bit to highlight. So this is really then the four-step process that I used to do those, those module, models that were uh, part of the introduction to this section. So, it's taking the piece and then priming it this with gray and then brush painting, uh, brush painting the item uh, with whatever base color you want. So this would be a white structure and be sure to then apply that paint along the grain of the model. Then the third step where it looks brownish is to take a thin wash and then just apply it very quickly over the surface. And so in this case, it was a brown wash. It could be black, but you can see how much the door stands out now. Just you go from this to, to this just with a wash. So it brings out the detail and it also adds any shadows in say the lower areas, the underside where light wouldn't hit. And then the fourth step there on the right is to just add highlights. And that's a little bit of dry brushing to bring, again, bring out the detail. Uh, you can use the same color that you base colored, in this case, that white color, or you can use a slightly lighter color. So look through uh, these examples. And they were, they were picked because just about every material, uh, whether it be basswood, cast urethane, uh, laser cut wood, previously painted plastic, uh, metal, uh, just about every material, it really doesn't matter what material you model with because you're going to really pretty much prime it to begin with and again, a lighter color. So this is a step where I'd recommend that you thoroughly inspect your model. So before you start the finishing steps, just make sure that all the gaps or if there's a glue smudge or anything else from a construction standpoint that you want to fix, do it now. You know, and then you can fix it and then reprime it and then you can start the finishing step. And by priming it a lighter color, we'll let you see any of those construction imperfections. So then base coating, um, again, the, the key is really paint along the grain of the wood. So if it's you know, vertical board and batten, paint this way. If it's novelty siding, paint along it, all right? And then a lot of times what I like to do is vary the color. So even if it's a white structure, I'll add a little bit of tan on individual boards just to vary the color a little bit. You can see the tan was added to green in the same fashion. So this is just a, also just a piece of glass. That's where I tend to work as a palette. Um, and then with, usually with these large surface areas, a flat brush that covers two to three or four boards. You want it too big, but certainly you can do several boards at one time. As far as making structures that aren't painted, that are raw wood, uh, you might want to consider then using a tan. And this was that same tan color that we saw flat black being dry brushed to kind of give it a gray color. Um, and then black and then mixing black and tan to get gray. The more black you put in, the more gray it becomes. And that's opposed to say black and white makes gray. So I think you get a warmer color and one that, that looks a little bit closer, at least to my eye, uh, more like weathered wood. So it's really a quick way to, to get you know, that type, type of hue. All right, so then washing, staining, uh, kind of used interchangeable, but here's where we then just take some paint, dilute it down, and you can see in this case, the black is very dilute. I mean, you can see the blue right through it. So a lot of water was used, whereas the brown is much darker stain or wash. 
And then you just want to take a, a larger brush and then just flood that on again in the same along the wood grain. And hopefully you can see then the, how much uh, those items are accented just by a very thin stain. And then you can go and add additional stains, particularly say along the bottom, if you want to show that the wood is much more weathered. Also, if you want to say impart a color. So this stain is very dark. So it's really changing the tan to a much browner color. And you can really do that in any fashion. So keep that in mind. But you can always continue to add stain after stain after stain. Just let it dry for an hour, add another stain. And you can do that over the entire structure or just individual ones like the door. And then dry brushing. This is really to bring out the detail. Uh, in this case, tan was used on both of these structures. This one was the one that painted like weathered wood. And this is more of a really a contrasting color. This is a really too stark, but I did want to make the uh, just a, an illustration of, of how light you can go. In, in this case, what I went back and did then was stained it with another darker green. So it made the, the boards darker and then it toned down the battens. So what you want to do then is, is use a, a fairly wide old brush. And why I say old is because this is very hard on the brush and the bristles will start to fray. But just put a little bit of paint on there and then take most of it and wipe and brush it off onto, I like to use a napkin or a paper towel with some texture. So then I can just work off most of the paint, work off most of the paint to the point where then I know that, all right, that's all that I need on there. And then just diagonally brush across the surface and do it one way and then brush it across the other way to bring out that detail. And so you can probably do a quarter of the model and then you'll just dab the paint, work it off and then go do this portion. And, and eventually you'll have the uniform dry brush to bring out that additional detail. All right, so then all of these four models then have gotten those basic painting, washing and dry brushing steps. So then it's time to go and add say uh, detail like painting the bands and the smoke jack and any of the door hardware. And then any selective staining and painting, for instance, if you want to change the color of the door or vary up the color of the shingles. So then do a, a use a pointed brush to then add any of the details that you'd like. So you can see in this case, almost all the metal details were just painted in uh, various brown colors to make them look rusty. So after you're set with that, um, then the final step is to go back and add some more detail, mainly with washing and dry brushing, and then things like the windows and window shades, uh, doorknobs. So that then would be the final step. So let's just maybe look at, say, this green shed. You can see the door. Um, in this case, the door was green, but by just applying, say, a dark brown wash, uh, now we have the brown door. Same thing with the shingles here, just a few black washes here. So it's really a light gray, completely light gray, but a few black washes here to bring out some of the shingles. Um, for instance, this tank, um, you know, it's pretty uniform top to bottom, but a few black washes down below uh, made it look much dirtier around the, the last two or three bands and then individual boards, sorry about that, individual boards then were also individually stained and, and dry brushed. So in any regard, um, you can continue to build detail or add weathering with just a little bit of paint here and there. So keep that in mind, uh, that, that that's a way to individualize your structures. Even though on these four, you use the same basic steps, applying those additional washes and such, then really individualize the, it, these models. All right, so then uh, we'll look at this last example, and this is really uh, weathering wood to make it look like the paint is fading or peeled off and, and chipped off. So this entire model, uh, with the exception of the shingles, which are paper, was, was made from a kit that, that Matt Woods had put out. And so it's the Ohio River and Western 
tool shed. So it, it's a very basic kit. So it really just has uh, four sides and two roof panels. Now it was laser cut um, and it was a little bit shallow on the battens for my taste in O scale, look more like HO. So just give me an idea, those hinges are actually laser cut onto the model. So I had some HO scale one by fours that were left over, so they're gray. So I just put those over the battens just to give it more of a 3D effect. And uh, the slate shingles were laser cut cardboard and they this is the first time i'd used those and, and they uh they're really nice to use and really have a nice effect for them so it's uh i think it's i shouldn't say cardboard it's more like mdf the medium density fiber but a very thin light colored variety that i had not seen before so after the model was assembled and it was really a very basic assembly uh, the, the entire model then was primed gray. And in this case, I just used acrylic and, and brushed it on. So I don't always spray, you, you don't always have to, but with wood models, um, even with the, uh, um, with the, the slate, cardboard slate, I, I just brush painted that on. And if acrylics, um, many times if you thin it down, you can almost do a couple of stains and really get the color that you're looking for, but I did want some variation. So the first step then here on, on this left half was then to take a hobby knife blade, oops, sorry about that, hobby knife blade, and then score it to make it look like it was really um, uh, weathered wood. And several times with it's it's not a, a new blade, but it's not really dull either. But it's just enough to really add a lot of texture on the boards and the battens. And then those kind of semi-gloss blobs that you see there all over that texture are masking uh, fluid that has dried. So it goes on white and then it dries to a clear blob. So some folks like to use, say, rubber cement. Um, I don't really like the smell, plus it's stringy. Uh, this masking fluid you can get at art and craft places. It, it's fairly expensive. It's probably 10 times more than the comparable volume of uh, rubber cement, but it is water soluble. It's not stringy. And what I like really about it is it goes on white so you can really see the contrast as you add. And you can dab it. I prefer to use, say, a toothpick or some other piece of basswood that's been cut because if you don't uh, wash out your brush every 20 seconds, it will adhere uh, to the brush. So you'll, you'll essentially get a toothpick effect with your brush if you're not diligent. But you can just then dab it in a pattern. Um, if you want to simulate peeling paint. So once then, and this, this side's been completely dabbed and then just a quick one coat um, coverage of white craft acrylic, then covered this entire side. And then uh, where you can see where the peeling paint, I just used a piece of masking tape or my finger to rub it off to get just a, a wide variety of areas where it looks like it's chipped and peeled off. So it's really that that quick to be able to do that. And then once the entire side was completely done, then I went back and added with just a small drill, uh, a few knot holes, and then went back with the same hobby knife blade and then added some more of those vertical uh, grain and just rough surface. And then after that was done, then washed it with a little bit, and in this case, actually quite a bit of flat black diluted acrylic, just washed it over. And it, again, there was a really a two-part technique, but the idea was to show then how dark you can get it um, but it's certainly you could do individual boards as well. And then point staining and, and sanding. So in, in this case, that very dark wash 
I went back and sanded some of the battens that really accented them. And so it left the battens a lot lighter than the boards underneath. And then the point staining would be to take some of that black acrylic and then just go over these areas two and three and four times this whole board to kind of vary it up from the way it was before. You see, this is a very uniform stain. But if you stain certain areas over and over again, then you can get those really dark areas or individual boards that are completely done. The other aspect that is if you felt that th this was too dark or that you did some of these areas too dark, you can just always take a, a brush and put rubbing alcohol on it and then blot most of it. You want it to be damp, not really full of it. And then just lightly scrub and then you'll scrub some of the dark say stain off and you'll get the white underneath so that's another way then it to really correct or vary up um, any of these any any of these surfaces and then because i wanted to accent these areas being a little bit less um, weathered than say down here then i went back and dry brush with a little bit of white i think some of these i took all the way down this so you can see the difference the point it, this is really, um, this is an unfortunate aspect, but I don't think I color balanced one of these shots. So that's why it looks so much different. This one looks a little bit more yellow, but it is really the same, the same model. And you can see how the, I mean, I look like if you look at just my hand coloring, that's pretty much how my hand looks. And this one looks near death with the pale color. But in any event, the idea was just to dry brush a little bit of white along the top here and along some of the battens to kind of bring out some of that texture. You can see a little bit more texture in the wood too. So very subtle, but um, I think uh, you can really see then that it starts to look like weathered wood with the really pr prominent um, wood grain. So in O scale, I'd like to also add nail heads and just use a pin and a pin vise. Usually I'll put a piece of blue tape across here and then just hit where I can. Sometimes the grain is so tough you can't really get a, a nail hole in there, but then just add those nail holes. And then to accent them, just to take some brown, uh, usually burnt umber, which is a very dark brown, and then just hit them with a wash. And you can see that it's a, this is a little bit too much, but it was exaggerated just to show you then uh, along here and here, then to accent, you know, and I'll continue it on to accent that nail hole row. And in that same fashion, we talked about removing some of the stain uh, for the, the, the black. You, you can do the same sort of thing where you use a brush that is just slightly dampened with rubbing alcohol then to rub it along here and remove some of that brown. So then it becomes very subtle where that nail line is. And then just to finish off the model, the, the hinges, the, the hasp and the lock, and then the door down here, some of that same brown that was used to accent the nail holes was selectively washed over and then streaked down these areas, uh, just to, again, to tie it over to make it look like at the slate, the wood siding, and all the metal components are all equally weathered and, uh, and really in needs of some repair or some attention. And as far as the base, in case you're curious, this is just a block of pink foam that was carved to make it look like um, uh, just uh, foundation rocks and, and then where I didn't carve anything I just painted it black because this will be set into a hillside uh, kind of a bank type uh, tool house. So with that um, I hope this clinic maybe will inspire you to not be inhibited by using any materials whether it be styrene or wood or cast urethane or some other um, some other component and then also think about maybe this stepwise painting washing, dry brushing to really build up some of the coloring and weathering of, of your models.